condemn the war of Russia's uh, Russia's war in Ukraine or such a nation. Um, and I was uh, repeating this to a lot of uh, US uh, colleagues as well that you may not have cared about Central Asia that much on the priority list of foreign policy in the United States, but maybe this time is, is different. It has to come much further up in that list of priority because Central Asia is indeed where uh, Putin feels the most loyal sort of uh, few handful of countries that, uh, that he can count on their votes. Uh, note that Putin undertook his first foreign trip to Dushanbe, Central Asia, after having started the war. Uh, I think it, it was even his first outing out of Moscow too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he didn't even go to Petersburg or Novosibirsk before going to Dushanbe and Ashgabat. Uh, so, this paper tries to uh, draw focus on what has what Putin has been trying to say and, and try to classify maybe, maybe order uh, some of his main lines of narrative that he wants to uh, pursue of relevance to the international audience. Not so much to the Russian audience for, for that. I think there are some other layers of uh, themes that he has been raising for the Russian audience, but for the rest of the world. I think uh, upon reading and logically putting together a wholesome picture in, from Putin's perspective, I think there are three things that we can uh, underscore as things that he wanted to sell in his verbalization of the war. One is to justify the war, that is, give for, for supposed uh, neutral observer, or impartial observer, to give, uh, build a case for why the war was necessary, why it of course, in his language, a special military operation was necessary, how it was justified. And to bring that justification, he brought in several lines of argumentation from uh, discrimination against the Russian speakers in Donbass and across the uh, Ukrainian uh, population, to NATO, um, uh, ceaseless expansion of NATO towards Russia, against Russia, accords between NATO and Russia, and to still larger to um, kind of connect this US centric unilateralism on, on the international stage, international affairs, and how this war is, in a way, Russia's rightful, uh, justified sort of revolt against this uh, American domination and unilateralism. And and in doing all of this, of course, what he has presented Russia as doing. The right thing, the only justified thing, and in fact, he has stressed in multiple occasions that this this was the last result, or uh, uh, an act of last resort. Nothing else was left uh, short of the war. Second, and correspondingly, uh, the next step when you have justified the war, then obviously you have to demonize the enemy, the other side. Demonize, dehumanize, vilify, inculpate, you know, different levels of things, but basically make it look like the other side deserved it. And here, of course, we have heard a whole barrage of terminology from the day one and slightly before the day one uh, about the neo Nazi regime in, uh, in Kiev. Uh, the, the genocide has been visited upon the Russian speakers of Ukraine. Uh, the uh, uh, militarization of the regime, he calls it regime, obviously they always only refer to it as regime rather than the government, and uh, fascist and whatnot. And the word nationalist as well in the Russian uh, usage has a very negative ring, not just uh, a descriptor, but actually a kind of condemning term, derogatory term, nationalist forces. That's how they for the ordinary soldiers. Um, and they, they uh, demonize the, the Ukrainian government that way, but also uh, throw in there what they call the collective West, collectively Zapad, uh, with again uh, inculpating them as well, that it, it is them who must be also uh, called to justice and to to be kept responsible, especially again on account of NATO's expansion and uh, always seeing 
Russia as the enemy. In fact, though maybe slip of a tongue, but we'll be picked up on, is that Putin has always referred to NATO, I mean, blame NATO for seeing Russia always as a threat uh, against which then uh, they were doing all this expansion and other buildups. But he, he never said and could probably not say that NATO always viewed Russia as the target, as the object of potential attack. So that Russia is a threat, I think, is empirically very correct to think based on what Russia has been doing. Uh, so uh, in a way, the language has been really uh, invest, uh, invested a lot into uh, demonizing and inculpating the other side. The other side included, as I said, Ukraine, the United States, NATO, and the collective West. Collective West is a standard term in Russian terminology. And the third, of course, again, sort of logically, is to normalize Russia or uh, maintain a sense of normalcy in Russia's daily affairs, in what Russia wants, in, in, what, in how Russia uh, interacts with the rest of the world, et cetera. So here again, this is to, in a way, to prevent or preempt this uh, alienation of Russia on the international scene, uh, to uh, prevent some uh, potential partners to, uh, from walking away from Russia, that Russia is actually, and there has been a, put a lot of language um, and acts, behavior into giving the sense that Russia is just about normal business. Uh, they talk about usual economic indicators, planning, the budget, uh, aid uh, distribution to various countries. And the is now got you know, a couple of dis dispersions, dispersals of aid since the war has started. Uh, he attends apparently non-military, uh, non-war-related uh, events and gatherings all the time. He even held his St. Petersburg Economic, Economic Forum, like nothing happened except that it was all too obvious that something's happened. Um, now, having said this, uh, to what extent does this sell? Just picking up on these three lines, I think, when you look at Central Asia's, Central Asian countries, and I hear I just uh, a caveat that Central Asia is a reference to the five countries, but primarily I, you mean the three countries that have spoken about that. Or Tajikistan and Turkmenistan have been pretty silent. Um, the what is it? My based on the behavior, acts, wordings, uh, speeches from high-level government representatives of these countries, primarily these three countries. I basically come to the conclusion, because I've given two minutes, that, <laughs> that uh, the Central Asian countries first uh, did not really justify, uh, did not really buy into this justification language. You do not hear at all uh, from any of the uh, public uh, expressions from the Central Asian governments that they somehow thought the war was justified, that the special military operation was justified. Uh, there were, have been different degrees of disapproval of this justification of, of, of all the war from Kazakhstan to Uzbekistan, uh, shifting places in the most for the sharpest sort of disapprovals or walkaways, to Kyrgyzstan being less so. But still, none of them just walked into this. Secondly, demonizing the enemies of the Kremlin? Absolutely not. Uh, Central Asian governments. States have not walked away from this demonized uh, partners. They have publicly reiterated multiple times on uh, how they actually value their relations with both the collective West, with the United States, and with Ukraine. Indeed, uh, when, when we say about Central Asian neutrality, uh, on another occasion with Omar, I was trying to argue that neutrality is actually something very telling. It's a very loud sort of neutrality where Russia. It's more to the dismay of Russia rather than to the disappointment of Kiev that Central Asian neutrality ought to be read. Because Russia had all the uh, expectations, grounds uh, to have Central Asian vocal supports, and they, and they didn't get it. Um, Kiev could, could just pass on 
Ukraine, uh, on Central Asia, that there wasn't really a very active sort of interaction economically, politically, or in any other. And yet, Central Asians from the early days of this war uh, expressly um, were saying both sides are equally friends to us, both sides are equally partners to us. When you look at the empirics of this equality, you, you realize this is just a statement, a very vocal statement of equality that uh, Russia should be very disappointed about. Lastly, I think the last uh, line, the like motif about normalcy of Russia, is the only one that has really been sort of supported, played along with uh, by Central Asian governments. And that is because the Central Asian governments do have these normal relations and economic integration and other relations. And by virtue of that practical flow of business, uh, Central Asian countries have worked along. Tokai went to St. Petersburg Economic Summit. Of course, he said the most awful thing that Putin would expect. Uh, Dushanbe and Ashraban hosted Putin. Uh, Mishkek hosted him first, but online. Um, so things have been going on that way. So my last point then, to really wrap it up, is that what is said, especially what is said by Putin, matters, but it matters not so much in the sense of a need to engage him at the level of his language, but rather to call his nonsense nonsense. Uh, countering the wrong subversive and false narratives is important, but not countering by, again, uh, engaging in, like, for example, uh, with the referendums that have obviously happened after I wrote this. The referendums in Donbass and uh, Zaporozhia, I think it should, from the day, from the very beginning, day one of announcement, it should just have been said, this is bullshit. No, excuse my language. But, Today, when we are looking for Putin's announcement of annexation, etc., this is just engaging him on the, at the level of his absolute and bizarre buildup uh, of the narrative of this whole war. And, and countering that, uh, we have to be building up counter uh, the, the other narratives, other narratives where indeed Putin's nonsense is shown both to the Russian population and the rest of the world, Central Asians. That this is nonsense. We are not really talking about things that Putin wants us to believe are real. And, and from that point, I think Central Asian neutrality needs to be really appreciated for what it has been uh, giving out in terms of uh, reception or reaction to this wishful. I was too excited to begin this panel and I forgot to reinforce the point that we will be following the same rules as in the previous uh, two panels, namely, we're going to stick to about eight minutes. Uh, I'll, be just, uh, I'll be just a little bit more lenient uh, with the um, with email, given that we have double presenters, we have double authors for the uh, remaining, uh, my, the, my, the, the remainder of this um, panel. <laughs> And we only have three presentations, three papers, but this is also a shorter panel instead of being an hour 45 minutes as the previous two panels were. This one is only one hour and 15 minutes. And we want to have you know, time for questions as well as uh, enough time for the follow up um, break. So, so, so wait, the double presenters get more time, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> it was uh, loosely worded eight minutes and a little bit of leaving at the end. So, I didn't you know, know it so. Up. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. So we're going to move on to the second paper uh, titled Balance in Security, Popular Support for CSTO Membership in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. In, uh, this paper is co-authored by Nina Smith from Indiana University and Pauline Jones from uh, the University of Michigan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, and thank you uh, to all my, my fellow panelists, especially to Paul for the uh, the comments. I'm looking forward very much to the comments and insights. Um, while the presentation gets loaded up, um, can you, is there a way we can do slide? Yeah. Uh, view? Uh, this is uh, part of a, a long term collaborative project with uh, my colleague Regina Smith, uh, funded by the uh, NSF, the National Science Foundation, 
And what we're trying to do long term is look at the legacies of the January 22 protest um, events in Kazakhstan. And of course, in conjunction with Russia's uh, war against Ukraine that started in February and how, uh, what those long term legacies are. One, one small part of that project uh, is, can everybody hear me okay without this? Yeah. One small part of that project is. It's, it's, Zoom needs it. Ah, very sorry. Uh, one small part of that project or slice of that project is to look at how uh, the January 22, 20, 2022 events, the uh, uh, Takaya's um, request for CSTO uh, intervention, which was granted, uh, and the subsequent war uh, in, in Ukraine launched by Russia, um, how all of those uh, have impacted uh, Kazakhstan's perceptions of ties, close ties with Russia. And we're using uh, attitudes toward CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, uh, as a sort of uh, window or proxy into what those attitudes toward, those broader attitudes toward um, uh, Russia uh, might be and might, how they might have been changed. Um, this is a picture from the May summit of the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization. And you, if you notice, you looked at You'll, you'll notice that only Takayev is looking away. Everybody else is looking forward, and everybody, only he is looking away. I thought it was a telling, telling photo uh, to start the presentation. Ah, but without further ado, um, I'm not able to advance this. All right, let's try this. There we go. Okay, so why the CSTO? Why are we looking at the CSTO and focusing on the Collective Security Treaty Organization? Well, this is, a, as everyone in this room probably knows, a not just a Russian-led, Russian-dominated security organization, collective security organization, but is also Russian-forged. Uh, beginning in 2002. Um, so it's very much associated with Russia. Um, uh, the CSTO of intervention is the second reason um, in, in the January pr uh, protest events. Um, many commentators thought this would be a, a, a boost to the CSTO um, after years really of inaction and effectiveness. Uh, note that the CSTO uh, refused to intervene in two major conflicts uh, prior to this, one in Kyrgyzstan in 2010, and then more recently, uh, the Ar Armenia Azerbaijani conflict in uh, the spring of 2021. Um, so as of the spring or even fall of 2021, there were many commentators who were saying the CSTO is an app, the CSTO is, is, is useless, the CSTO has no future. Um, and then boom, the CSTO responds to uh, Nazarbayev. Ooh, that was a slip. Accedes uh, uh, <laughs> to Takayev's request um, to, to come uh, and intervene uh, in these, these, these protests, some of which turned violent uh, in January, 2022. Um, and this importantly, and this, here's part of the bridge and the connection with the war in Ukraine, is that this is the first action in which the CSTO is used uh, to combat these threats to national stability that are at the heart of the, Russia's false narrative um, and its uh, justification to attack Ukraine as Emil was talking about in his remarks. The third reason we focus on the CSTO as a proxy for relations with Russia and attitudes toward relations with Russia um, is that this seemed to have a big impact on public opinion, or at least we we hypothesized that it had a big uh, big impact on public opinion. Um, it, you you saw that there was, um, and then I'll talk about this more in a minute. There was some turn against uh, the CSTO, um, not just in Kazakhstan but also in neighboring countries. Um, and we think that the war in the Ukraine, to the extent that the CSTO intervention had an impact, a negative impact on public opinion that the war in Ukraine would exacerbate this effect. Um, why public opinion? So when some of you might be scratching your head and saying, well, geez, Kazakhstan is a authoritarian country. Doesn't she know that? Public opinion doesn't matter. Well, actually, <laughs> public opinion does matter in authoritarian countries. And we think it's, it's increasingly important in the context of uh, Kazakhstan's trajectory post January 2022. Um, popular support for the CST inter CSTO intervention was very tepid at best. And there were some outright protests in some parts of the country um, to the intervention, even though it was very short-lived intervention. The, the troops were in and out in a matter of days. Um, the second reason we focus on public opinion is that the Takayev regime has become increasingly sensitive to public opinion following these January 22, 2022 protest events. Um, it's in particular backed away from some of its narrative Importantly, one of the things we're tracking in this project is a narrative that the state uses to describe these protest events and how that changes over time, as well as its response to those protest events. And you see more and more to kind of backing away from a Maidan-like um, uh, comparison and backing away from calling them the, the January tragedy as opposed to the January events. And that's resonating with the population. Uh, the third reason we think popular public opinion matters is that there's been very little popular support. I think Mill also uh, noted this in his remarks for Russia's war against Ukraine. Um, there's, a, there's a great poll that was done by the Kiev School of Economics 
finds only 20% of Kazakhs, Kazakhstanis uh, are supportive and the majority of those are ethnic Russians. The interpretation there I think is really important. We can talk about that later, I probably don't have time now, um, but it has something to do with that section of the population buying the Russian justification narrative uh, for the invasion that Emil talked about and the Kazakhs population, ethnic population not buying that. So I think that's a really important point. Um, and the fourth reason is that the government the Takai regime, the government, it seems to be aligning with public opinion when it comes to their lack of support for the war in Ukraine. And I think that's part of the story. It's not the only part, but it's part of the story for why you haven't seen, um, you've seen this so-called neutrality, but it's not just neutrality. I think, that, I think the centralism governments, particularly Kazakhstan, deserve some credit for going much further than just neutrality on this point. Um, so um, what we did, how we did this, uh, how we studied, um, it's very difficult to directly, if not impossible, uh, and not advisable to ask people directly sometimes these sensitive types of questions. So we didn't go around asking people, um, you know, whether or not they like Russia or they uh, support a membership in the uh, Collective Security Treaty Organization. We did something called the LIST experiment, which again, I can talk more about in the Q&A, um, and my, my colleague can as well. But the idea here is list and experiment. Both of those are the crucial components. So the list part is you give people a, a, a list of possible policies and you ask them not to tell you which ones they approve of, but how many on this list. So they don't actually have to, to come be forward enough to tell you which ones they support, just how many. And the experiment part is you divide the sample. So, so you have one, one part of the sample gets only a partial list. So the, the, first, the first four you see here, which I won't read aloud because again, I'm going to stay within time. Uh, and the other half of the sample gets all five. And then you compare the means and the samples for how many they told you they approve of. Um, what we find, and I, I'll give you just a, a few, like maybe a few seconds to read this, right? So, because we're asking about different kinds of policies, support for different kinds of policies. One has to do with foreign investment. One has to do with membership in the Eurasian Economic Union. We can talk more again, why we chose these particular um, policies in the Q and A. Um, one on promoting tourism. This is something Kazakhstan's actually doing. Uh, and one on maintaining open borders. Um, and we wanna avoid ceiling effects. So we ask about some policies we don't expect to necessarily be very popular and others we expect to be very popular. Okay, so that's the list. Half the sample gets four, half the sample gets all five. And what we found is that there is very weak support using this approach. There is very weak support, at least in our sample, which is nationally representative um, for membership, continued membership in the CSTO. We think this is striking. We think this is a really important finding and we think it's likely, Paul might disagree, <laughs> we think it's likely to, um, in, well, actually supports that likely to decrease uh, as a result of the next wave we'll do in this survey or the larger we'll do in the survey, which is gonna be post escalation. And I can talk about why we think that is more in the Q&A again. Um, but, so what we find is overall sample, only 55% support continued membership in the CSTO. We also find that this is, there are heterogeneous effects. So we find that there are different parts of the sample that are more or less supportive. So if you look, it'll jump out at you right away. You'll see that men tend to support membership more than women. We think this will flip, <laughs> like big time. <laughs> yeah, um, or not even flip, but that the men will, will, will be closer to the, to the women on this. Um, those with um, university education are, uh, you know, uh, much more likely to, much less likely, much less likely to be supportive of CSTO membership than those with only secondary or less education. Um, Russian, ethnic Russians are more likely to support CSTO membership than ethnic Kazakhs. And we think there's a good reason for this as well. Our interpretation is that Russians might see Russians. So again, going back to this narrative, they might buy the narrative and they also, may also see that as some way of maintaining their own security if they feel uh, insecure in the context of a, of a rising Kazakhstan. Um, and then finally, regionally, those in the capital city, Amati, Nur Sultan, uh, which is not, no longer, now it's back to Astana, <laughs> right? So this is how like up to date we have to be on our slides, um, are much less likely to support CSTO membership. And those are precisely the places where the CSTO troops intervened. So um, in, in many ways, this is what we expected to find. We're also uh, quite, uh, intrigued and surprised by by the, the lack of support that we found. So thank you. I, I forgot my last slide and Maria's being like, nice to me, let me do it. So why this matters? I forgot to say why this matters. This is like the whole punchline, Pauline. <laughs> yep. um, this is why I should have coffee uh, at lunch. Um, so first of all, th this is 
the intervention has not been the, the boost to the CSTO that many expected. Um, it also hasn't been an end of multivectorism. Um, as as Nagis Kosenova, who's in the, the audience, uh, very, very presently said, you know, this might be a, a boom for, for Russia, um, but it's not, it doesn't signal a, a retreat or a return to Russia's orbit. So she was right about that. Many commentators were wrong. Um, secondly, um, this negative effect on public opinion, as we said, it's likely to increase. If there's weak support before the escalation, when we go into the field next week, there's likely to be even, even uh, weak, weaker support. Um, and then finally, we think that if this continues, um, if Kazakhstan continues on this trajectory, if the rest of the war in Ukraine continues on this trajectory, if Takayev continues to care about public opinion and he's just called the SNAP presidential election in November, so I'm, I'm guessing he does, um, this, could be, this could mean that membership in CSTO and closer relations with Russia become a domestic liability for Takayev. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to move on to the last presentation titled, What Does Russia's Invasion of Ukraine Mean to Central Asia? It is also co authored by Javier Durayev um, from Crossroad Central Asia and Eric Maglinche from George Mason University. All right, thank you. I'm starting my stopwatch. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so um, uh, I'd like to bring you back to June in St. Petersburg, White Knights, and uh, President Putin and President Sakai are sitting in white chairs. Uh, and I want to make explicit uh, the comment from Sakai that has been implicit uh, and not fully articulated uh, by my colleagues. I just want to I want to emphasize how this is not neutrality. That's as much as much. This is a critique of Russia. Uh, so Putin uh, says at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum uh, that the, uh, the territory of the former Soviet Union is in effect the historical territory that belongs to Russia. Uh, and Chikai says, wait, 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 no, 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 no. Uh, and and he, he, he directly rebukes Putin uh, and he says that the quasi-state entities of Alkhans and Donetsk are uh, not going to be recognized by Russia. So a direct rebuke um, uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, pretty, pretty impressive, uh, not neutrality, but, but this is direct opposition. Um, and so one thing that Shire and I have been thinking about is uh, this kind of curious reality that there's been no Central Asian country that has come out and expressed support for what's going on. Um, and it's curious in a few ways. I mean, one, it's curious for exactly what Pauline was just talking about. Uh, and that in January, five months earlier, uh, Takayev had called in uh, Russian troops and said, hey, help me out here, right? Uh, and Russia came in. Um, and the fact that Takayev is, is now so uh, forceful in his critique, I think is, is interesting. But also in the other countries, um, uh, there, there's a big Russian military presence in Tajikistan. Uh, there's a big Russian military presence in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and Russia is, in, uh, is, is a leading economic partner for all five of these, of these countries. So it is, I think, and I think Shire would agree, uh, surprising that the Central Asians have been um, so forward in, in, in their critique of Russia. Um, and Sharon, I think this is potentially attributable to four dynamics. And I mean, I know my methodology person, my methodology right saying you've got a zero variation design, this is problematic, but I'm going to go with it anyway, right? Uh, and so Sharon, I think we can attribute this to uh, first Central Asia's geography. Um, Second, Central Asia's position in global financial markets. Uh, third, Central Asia's strong championing of state sovereignty. Uh, and then uh, fourth, uh, generational change in the reality that Central Asia's political elites are no longer uh, as closely networked uh, with Russian political elites as we've seen in the past. I'm gonna talk about the first two uh, and Shire will talk about the second two. Um, so geography, and I think this is probably the more complicated of the two that I, I have here. Uh, um, there's two aspects that are going on here. Uh, first is that Central Asia uh, is surrounded by countries that are very different from the countries that say Belarus and Ukraine are surrounded by. So Central Asia is surrounded by autocracies. And what we think this does is this allows Central Asian countries to be critical of Russia and not have the Kremlin be all that concerned because frankly, there's nowhere for Central Asia to go that is geopolitically challenging to Russia. Um, so that's the, the first aspect of this geopolitics. The second one is a little bit more uh, complicated. Um, and this, this 
came to me actually through a conversation with a doctor friend of mine in, in Fishkeit this summer. Um, and he was telling me about how he has family friends uh, in Russia who uh, have a, an ice cream business uh, and they need special computer chips for the freezers uh, and they can't get them in Russia. So what they're doing is they have people coming through Kyrgyzstan with uh, suitcases um, from Europe to Kyrgyzstan with suitcases with these microchips and then going into Russia. And that's how they're getting these, these special, this special technology that's going on. And I think this is a microcosm of what Central Asia is doing for Russia right now. Maybe not the Central Asian governments, but certain Central Asian economic entities. This has become a new port of entry for Russia for critical technology. Uh, and so I think the Kremlin understands that uh, and the Kremlin wants this to continue. And almost paradoxically, uh, I think, and maybe, maybe I'm going too far out on a limb here, but it may be actually in Russia's interest for Central Asian countries to be critical of Russia because it's less likely that Central Asian economic entities are gonna fall under sanction if Central Asia is being perceived as being critical. Pauline's giving me the... <laughs> uh, uh, no, that's fine, yeah. So anyway, but, but I think the point still stands that because Central Asia is economically critical technologically critical for getting goods into Russia. Uh, I, th I think that point, I think that point stands. Um, Pauline, we can talk about that. Um, and then the last thing, and I realize I'm at, I'm at four minutes. Um, I'll be very quick here. Uh, uh, as far as um, Central Asia's own interests uh, in being critical of Russia, uh, Central Asia is anticipating a 25% decline in remittances from Russia. The economic role that Russia once played is much diminished. Central Asia is very dependent now on global financial markets, being integrated in these global financial markets uh, for continued, you know, whatever revenue it can get. Um, Central Asia does not want to fall under Western sanctions. Um, and so to that degree, I think it's very much in Central Asia's interest not to uh, side with Russia. But there's other deeper things that are going on here, and Shara's going to talk about that, particularly this idea of Central Asia's commitment to state sovereignty and generational change. So Shara. Right, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, pleasure to see you all here. So Eric provided two first arguments about why, how can we explain or understand Central Asia's reluctance to support and endorse Russia's uh, war in Ukraine. And these belong to more systemic IR arguments. Well, there is a small, weak Central Asian state, and there's big Russia, which is kind of allowing, or maybe even desiring Central Asia's neutrality kind of position. And also there's a West on which Central Asia is very much dependent on, and we don't want to make the West unhappy very much. Uh, so these are very old arguments. Central Asia is small, and even the panel, you know how the panel is titled? Central Asia in the shadow of war. Central Asia is always in the shadow. <laughs> Whichever conference you go, it's either in the shadow of the China or the war in Afghanistan, now the shadow of the war in Ukraine. So uh, now the second two, remaining points, we try to kind of turn the angle and look whether there is an agency of Central Asia that we can see in the explain in understanding Central Asia's position, namely the failure to endorse Russia, which is, which is puzzling why it should be a puzzle, but it is a puzzling in the Central Asian context. So the first argument is about the state sovereignty. Russia, of course, and Emil described in the beginning, offered many explanations. There's a NATO defense, Russia needs to defend against NATO, genocide against Russians in Donbass and so on. But Central Asian leaders see nothing other than a big power attacking a smaller power. And moreover, the country on the attack is a former Soviet Republic whose right to in the existence Russia is denied. So, Central Asian states, five republics being relatively small and weak, they feel and share Ukraine's troubles in this position and not Russia's grievances. And, and the, by the skin, uh, we should say. Of course, Central Asia is not Ukraine and that we are not potential NATO members nor experimenting with liberal democracy, the way like Georgia or Ukraine would be described. Nevertheless, uh, Putin more than once reminded that the arguments of Russia or Putin on Ukraine applied to Central Asia very much. And we remember, I think the Kazakh colleagues here remember well, I guess. And we also remember Putin's remark about 
Kazakhstan not having any statehood before Nusultan Nazarbayev produced one in 1991, which is very much in line with what uh, Putin provided for Ukraine. So uh, to cut short, we think that uh, the Central Asian states leaders view the whole event through the prism of the threat to uh, state security. And this is in line with basically all the foreign policy concepts. If you study Central Asian uh, foreign policies, we have multi vectorism of Kyrgyz and Kazakh, self reliance of Uzbeks, political neutrality of uh, Turkmenistan. All of that is nothing but an effort to kind of distance and manage the big brother role of uh, Russia here. And so we see uh, in this context, we think that uh, despite the fact that Central Asian regimes are shared very much with Putin and with Russia, still the allergy of Central Asian leaders to re revising the 1991 status quo is uh, too big for us to swallow. And I think the state sovereignty risk remains sort of a red line for Central Asian states in many ways. The second argument is the generational change. And uh, I think this is a, a bit of misnomer. Maybe we can revise the phrasing because generational is very much kind of, it sounds like almost uh, biological. But the point is that uh, the assumptions of the audience for the support of Central Asia that would provide to Russia very much builds on the political and cultural links that Central Asians have, are known to have with Russia. But now we claim that in 2022, 30 years after 1991, things have changed. With the death of the Uzbek president in 2016 and departure of Nazarbayev from political scene in 2022, I guess, or 18 or 22, whatever you prefer, <laughs> what we have is that no Central Asian state now has a leader whose political career, high level political career, was built during the Soviet Union. Uh, and none of them would have really direct political and the personal connections to Russia, Russia's elites. Uh, a good example is uh, Central Kyrgyzstan. You know, we have five presidents in the past, five or six, we lost the count. The, the first president, Akhaev, hardly speak Kyrgyz. He spoke perfect Russian. And the current president hardly speaks Russian. He speaks very well Kyrgyz. And uh, the change was quite gradual. I think that's the, one of the illustrations of how the political elite is changing now. Second, uh, the broader international environment, political environment, the 90s and early 2000s, we remember that it was the period when Russia was critical for Central Asians as a shield against democracy promotion by the West. Now, 2022, things have changed. The democracy promotion has passed its peak. And uh, I don't know who was the last US president who mentioned democracy promotion particularly in Central Asia, I, I can't remember. It's, it's long ago, early 2000s, maybe middle of 2000s. So the regime's autocracies successfully survived the attack in their view of the Western liberal democracy promotion. So they are all intact, with the exception of Kyrgyzstan, of course. Um, and the, the, which basically means that the Russia's role as a shield against the liberal democracy promotion by the West is no more relevant. We are, having a fine relationship with the West and the West understands us much better than it's, it pretended to understand in, uh, 15 years ago. And then finally, the population. There is a huge argument that, okay, Central Asian states and populations have been very much nostalgic, two minutes, okay, great. Nostalgic about the Soviet Union. Uh, and indeed, Central Asia has been very much reluctant to leave United, uh, the Union of the Soviet Republics, USSR. But uh, today, I think the, if you look at the public opinion, of course, public opinion in Central Asia is never, never matters and not really measured well, apart from some uh, experiments that we just heard. We, uh, and, uh, but uh, what, if you live in Central Asia, you know that the public opinion is loud and it doesn't matter how, what the percentage, but the social media now provides channel to hear the loudest people. And the loudest people today are the nationalists, populists, pro-Western liberals who speak English and who've been first to learn the master Facebook and uh, Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I think these people are putting much pressure on the state leaders compared to the citizens of the Soviet Union who are the youngest of them are probably in the fifties or sixties. So the population is different. The, basically the landscape is very much different from what we saw early on. Which basically leads me to conclude. So Eric had an introduction and I have a conclusion. 
big point. First, what, what should we make out there? First, Russia's role in Central Asia is declining, and the war in Ukraine is only accelerating the process. That's the basic contention that uh, we have been really the last allies of this, uh, Russia, of Russia, but uh, Russia is losing it because of the war in Ukraine. Nevertheless, and that's the second point, I think, and we think with Eric, I think, I don't know whatever <laughs> Eric agrees, but uh, we, this is our draft paper and we'll have to discuss it uh, further, that we believe that Russia, whatever the outcome of the Ukraine war is, will come back to Central Asia and will try to reinstate whatever position is losing. And still, Moscow has too many buttons and Central Asia has too many vulnerabilities that make those buttons work. And we know that the old and tested strategy of Russia, divide and rule, and Central Asia is a perfect place. Central Asia is a perfect place to get divided and be ruled. There are too many fault lines over there. And finally, what will be the message to the international community, and whatever we and you understand as international community? Uh, I think that the international community would have to take this opportunity, take this moment as a historical moment when the Central Asia is finally about to divorce from the Soviet past. And this is the moment where Central Asian nationalists, autocratic elites, and democratic civil society might be more or less combined and unified in the efforts to uh, decrease the connection, decrease the linkage, decrease the dependence on Russia. So mm -hmm. that is, I think, what should be encouraged and support. And first, the international community should support the regional platforms. We know that Russia has historical record of intervening whenever there is a Central Asian only platform, Central Asian Union and so on. Whenever Russia is excluded, it would join and then that union would be disappearing. So I think uh, we still don't, we, we don't have any institutionalized regional platform as of today, other than this consultative meetings, very cautious framing and phrasing but I think the international community should, in any in all possible ways, support the meetings of Central Asians without Russia. And second, Central Asia must diversify connections, basically energy transport-wise, particularly, uh, to cut the dependence on Russia. And I think that is what we heard recently that was it Blinken was saying that we will do whatever possible for Central Asian, for Central Asian states to not have or at least decrease the. Uh, dependence on the on the Russia. So let me stop here. I think a couple of other points, but uh, since I think I used up my two minutes, uh, thank you very much. And the remaining will be for Q and A session. Thanks. We have a moment to our discussion. Uh, Paul Stronsky kindly agreed to um, read and comment on the, on, on the papers. Paul Stronsky, the senior fellow at Russian Eurasia Program, uh, Carnegie Endowment for Research. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a whole bunch of notes. I, I typed up some notes earlier today. I typed up notes uh, a little bit yesterday, too. And one of the things that I think this, the all three of these papers, um, particularly um, uh, 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 Regina Smith and Pauline Jones, their data is really recent um, when you look at that paper. But in reading those papers over the last couple of days, I realized how dynamics are just changing so fast in this region, how they're changing so fast in Russia, how they're changing so fast in Ukraine, and how they are changing so fast in um, in. Uh, in Central Asia. So when I went to go look at the notes I did yesterday, I realized after reading Putin's speech, I needed to change things a little bit. Um, uh, and I'd like to get you know, people's perspectives on what we heard today, which I found extremely terrifying, actually. Um, uh, so, um, <clears throat> but, you know, in their paper, you know, the, the, the um, uh, Jones and Smith, they note that, you know, their survey data was before, you know, the, 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 the conflicts in, in uh, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, um, it was before the collapse of Russia at Kharkiv. It was before the, the mobilization order. Um, well, you know, a couple of things have happened um, since then. We now have 100,000 um, Russian men who fled to, uh, fled to Kazakhstan. I think that is a dramatic change. Uh, my, you know, people can predict migration patterns. I don't think anybody predicted that migration pattern um, a week ago. And I think that very well could, you know, if all of a sudden Russians in Kazakhstan see all these Russians come come fleeing and all, all these men in Kazakhstan see all these men come fleeing. How is that going to switch? I think you, you started to address that. I think I'd like to hear more about that. Um, but that was one of the questions um, uh, I had. Um, 
when um, I was reading these papers also, um, you know, there is, I think both, um, um, both the other papers highlighted this sort of careful balancing, dancing act that these countries are doing that is neutrality, but not quite neutrality. Well, over the last week, I would say we've moved, these countries have moved a little bit more away from neutrality to, to Kiev last week, pretty much condemning in no uncertain terms, the sham and illegal annexation uh, referendums. Um, and then just this morning, uh, the Uzbekistan uh, MFA basically said the exact same thing uh, and reiterated uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity in direct response to what to Putin's speech today. I think that they moved away from neutrality to something else. That's just happened um, uh, 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 today. Um, and then another thing that I think is, is interesting, um, I don't know if anybody has, has, has read uh, or seen Zelensky's speech from today, but he asked for accelerated membership to NATO and spoke about how he was defending or how the Ukrainian people were defending the sort of the broader world um, and he said, you know, because Ukrainians are dying, this is like paraphrasing, because Ukrainians are dying uh, and fighting Russia in Ukraine, we are preventing the spread of war uh, to the Baltics, to Poland, to Moldova, and to Kazakhstan. Um, that, I think, um, you know, this idea of, you know, I, I can't imagine he would say that without at least the Kazakhs being flagged that this was going to gonna come. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I um, haven't heard a response, but I think that is also um, uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, now to go through, you know, individual um, um, uh, papers, um, I'd be really interested also in knowing, I mean, it looks like you have some data on the Eurasian Union. Um, uh, I'd be interested in sort of trying to figure out what you think about that, because I think that's another indication of Russia. It's not the same as the CSTO, but particularly with sanctions, particularly with collapsing remittances, particularly with this switch of migration patterns, um, uh, uh, I'd be very interested in, in sort of trying to get, and I think that's something that, that uh, you, should, you should look at. Um, you spoke about the CSTO and others did too, and, and sort of the, Arme the, uh, the Kazakhstan, Tajikistan question and how things might be changing there. Um, I think just for your research, it'd be really interesting to actually try to get that same data from Armenia, because you sort of see a huge anti-CSTO movement, protests on the street right now, somewhat different, but um, in, in Armenia, the CSTO came, uh, did not come and help them, but, but they did go into Kazakhstan. There's a huge shift there. It would be quite interesting to sort of get that, that um, I don't know how you can do it, but be quite, uh, quite interested um, uh, to do that. Um, never Emil uh, Jurives, his, uh, I really liked his focus on language. Um, and as a former um, policymaker who's written speeches, um, I think it's really important to focus in on what they're saying and the tiny little nuances um, of how things things uh, are, are going. Um, a couple things that I've just noticed this week, um, and your paper reminded me of that. Um, first of all, was Putin today talking about the US pretext of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, and that's kind of worrying that he's talking about pretexts that somebody else has used it. Um, but also, um, Jake Sullivan, the US National Security Advisor was on, I think it was Meet the Press this, this weekend. Um, and Tony Blinken was on another one. Um, and before they were talking about their concern about the irresponsible rhetoric coming out of the Kremlin about nuclear weapons, um, they up that to uh, a very dangerous situation, um, which I also think, um, you know, what, is that, what does that mean? Um, and so I think you're really right to sort of look at, at language, language change. And I think just in the last couple of days, we've seen the Central Asian governments switch their language. And I think that's quite, quite important. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about what you mean by normalizing Russia? Um, uh, uh, you know, yeah, is it is it just visits? Is it is it what? But I, I'd really be interested in that. That was something that that I that I um, struggled with in reading the paper. Um, but then I'd also, for everybody, really, I'd also like to get sort of you know we're here in Washington, the State Department's across the street, the White House is right down there. You know, what does your research say um, for the United States? What is it? What are the policy implications? Um, for the United States, what are the policy implications for the Central Asian governments? And then I think both two of two of them, you know, what are the po policy implications for civil society in in the region? Um, I think that is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, key. Um, and then the last paper, um, uh, I would kind of like to sort of hear both from um, Pauline, Regina, um, Eric uh, about generational change, because I think you both highlighted it and it comes up in your, 
in your data, it comes up in their, their paper um, and how you sort of see that. Um, but also, you know, we might be seeing it on the bottom up, but it'd be interesting to see, you know, we're seeing governments start to change, not at the top levels yet, but everybody in the MFAs are now in their, in the, the mid rankings are now in their 30s, 40s. Um, and I think we're gonna see things um, shift there um, as well. Um, and then perhaps just, um, some discussion of yes, uh, this could be a place where where sanctions evasion is happening, um, but we're also seeing you know the mirror card goodbye um, in in Central Asia the last last couple of weeks. That's going to be a huge problem for all those Russians who just arrived, um, by the way. Um, uh, and so I think that's uh, another uh, piece. Um, uh, and then finally, um, I think we did sort of hear that that you know Central Asia maybe needs to be higher on the agenda of the West here. Um, uh, but there still is some, some differences. I do agree that the United States is not talking about um, democracy promotion like we used to, but if you look at the rhetoric of this war, this is a war between democracy and autocracy. And how does that sort of play into this region? Um, and how, does, how do you sort of take that into, into your discussions? Um, and then finally, um, uh, if you uh, read Putin's speech today, he was talking about uh, the regime in Kiev and its masters in Washington, DC. That to me, um, you know, indicates they don't you know, accept sovereignty of any of these countries. But if we're going to put if the United States, the West, the collective West is going to sort of engage higher, put Central Asia higher on the agenda. How do you do that in such a tense geopolitical environment, um, uh, even if it is a di different geo geographic location? Um, but still, um, I think it's still quite tense. So thanks. Great papers. Thank you very much. So I'm going to give each panelist uh, to uh, to respond to Paul's question in about a, with a minute or two. And to complicate this task, I'm actually going to post a question of my own. Present <laughs> <laughs> so presenters. So uh, Anil, for you, uh, I a big a big fan of uh, the performance function of language. Um, so I agree with a lot of things that you said. But the question that I had for you was. Can we really ascribe um, the language spoken by Putin to Putin only? Could it be that the language that he chooses is actually selected precisely because it is the language that is spoken by the targets of his communications? And in this regard, I'm kind of um, thinking about that very famous phrase um, that he said, um, you know, during the um, Second uh, Chechen War um, or counterterrorism operation, where he said that he was going to kill Chechens in. In the, in, in, the, um, in the toilet, you know. So, and so it was, it was a very colorful phrase, but it was the phrase that strongly resonated within the Russians, and it was kind of language that was spoken in many households. Mm -hmm. So um, my second question is for the second and third paper, uh, and both papers agree um, that it, uh, Central Asian republics are turning away from Russia. A question that is maybe a little bit outside the scope of your research, but I think it's a very important one to ask, which is, where are the Central Asian Republics turning to? Because I think uh, where they're turning to is going to condition whether or not Russia can come back. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last question is for uh, the last uh, paper. And that one is about you know the sovereignty argument. So I wonder if it's about sovereignty or if it's about kind of that new imperial post-colonial sentiment. Um, so, and can we, can we um, um, decouple the two? So I'll just leave it there. Thank you. But uh, we can start probably in the same order in which uh, papers were presented. So, Anil. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, first, uh, directly to the a couple of questions. Uh, what do I mean by normalization of Russia or uh, trying to impart this sense of normalcy about mm -hmm. Russia? It's really, uh, I mean, uh, trying to prevent any panicky, any uh, uncertainty about Russia uh, arising from amongst partners or amongst the sort of West colleagues uh, in Central Asia in particular. So that, uh, the, because right after the 24th of February, there was, of course, the sense that Russia is in the war. Now what happens? Nothing's, uh, we don't know about anything. Do we go to the nuclear war? Do we go? Do we, uh, will we co uh, see a collapse of the country? And for Putin, especially, uh, uh, do we expect the Kremlin government, the administration, to collapse? So he has been trying to impart nothing's happening, nothing big is happening in Russia. Don't worry, 
business as usual. We're just having this little uh, special military operation in Ukraine, but everything else is fine. Our commitments are fine. Putin is as strong as ever. So that. Um, implications for the U.S. Uh, uh, policy for U.S. I didn't make that uh, major part of my joint recommendation. The implications that I can confirm. The only one I was trying to stress is, of course, that uh, given this. Uh, what Russia wanted to sell, among others, to Central Asia, and how Central Asia did not buy it. I think the US foreign policy needs to appreciate that and pick up and give that lending hand uh, for Central Asians to be further able to maintain that uh, uh, non-purchase of uh, Putin's uh, language, uh, Putin's uh, verbal sales, and giving about Putin's language now. I think uh, my speaking of, about Putin's language is also not so much academic or uh, empirically uh, I'm trying to be accurate, but strategic. I think it's important to stress and to, even when we know that Putin has a whole bunch of uh, supporters among both the Russian population and especially the elites, where Maria Snigovaya talked about the com uh, continuity of elites in Russia, I think it is very important when it comes to a very final decis decisive point and when we talk about uh, nuclear weapons very seriously, that there is an escape route and there is uh, understanding among even people like, I don't know, Midhead or Lavrov and people like that, that it, this is indeed Putin's war and the world, most of the world thinks this is Putin's war and there is, and when it comes to pushing the button, we don't want to die. I mean, uh, and if this is seen as Putin's war, and, and Putin has been, I think, whatever, even if there is this uh, larger following and buying of this war among the Russian elite and the population, but still, Putin is a spearhead. Putin is the one who has shaped it. And I think, uh, as it were, uh, what do you say? We need, we need to uh, put the questions to Putin's door. To focus and to make that very important clear. I, I will try my best to address as many of the questions as possible. Um, so, uh, in terms of how the flow of Russian refugees who are escaping the, the, the draft and mobilization to Kazakhstan, I, I think that's going to affect CSD, CSTO support. It's going to be an even greater decline mm -hmm. uh, across the board, I would argue. I think even among ethnic Russians, right? um, I, I, but you know that that's that needs longer elaboration. Um, in terms of the neutrality uh, issue, this is one I think I, I want to talk a little bit longer about. Um, I agree with you and with others on the panel that, um, that as I said, that the village has been more than be neutral. But I don't think it's new or recent. I just think it's bolder, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, and one of the indications of this I would go back to is the May summit speech that Nazarbayev, oh, I did it again. <laughs> it took high May. This is what happens when you stay in the region too long. Um, oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. Um, what, <laughs> when Tokayev makes his speech, it's very telling that he points out that the CSCO really needs to be limited mm -hmm. in its scope to protecting territorial integrity and sovereignty of its member nations. It's, it's a very poignant moment. It's also why he's looking away in that picture. Um, <laughs> So I, I would I would um, I would really emphasize that, that, that this is a turning point for Central Asia, and it's also also a turning point for the United States to turn back to the region. Um, it, it, it's time. Um, I think that in terms of support for the Eurasian Economic Union, we haven't uh, processed that data yet. But I would say that if you look at data going back uh, even a year ago, uh, the Central Asia Barometer, for example, you'll see that there's widespread support very high level among both ethnic and ethnic Russians and ethnic Kazakhs for ties, economic ties with Russia, but not so much for Russia's, no, they, there is a dislike for Russia's foreign policy and its international position, but there's strong support for economic relations with Russia. The, the reasons that people supported economic relations with Russia are all fading away. I mean, they're all, um, it's, it's not just the, the sanctions, um, it's not just the, the lack of grain imports coming from um, Ukraine uh, to Kazakhstan are crucial for the country, um, but it's also um, the the fact that Russia is just not being a reliable economic partner. So it needs to find a reliable economic partner as well as a reliable security partner. That's not China, right? 
Um, particularly, this, China's economy is doing much worse. There are others in the room I know that know much more about China's domestic situation than I do. But my understanding is that China's economic situation is, is very bad. It's backing away from all of its belt and road initiative investments. Um, and and security-wise, uh, the Russians are sort of. The, the Chinese are a, a worse choice in many ways for the Central Asians than the Russians. At least some, some Central Asians would argue this. Um, so the United States really has an opportunity here. And the question is, what is it going to do? Um, so obviously, if there's some behind the scenes thing that the United States government can do, it doesn't have to be um, uh, very um, uh, escalating, I guess, in form. But one of the things that I think about, and it's been, I think, really, really important. Um, to give, again, the Central Asian government's credit for is that they're accepting these refugees, and they're unlike other parts of the world, including the parts that used to belong to the, to the Soviet Union, uh, like the Baltic states, they're welcoming these refugees. Why not help them absorb these refugees? Help them do that economically, educationally, give people opportunities to resettle, to not just go to areas that are already, you know, predominantly populated by Russians, um, but, but actually... I don't want to say, I don't want to say, it's a poor word choice. I don't mean assembly, but become part of the Kazakhstani nation, right? Really integrate into the world. Why not? Why not do that? That's a great opportunity. It's not going to cost that much money. So I do have factual information. Okay. So um, actually 70% of the respondents who were young supported membership in CIA. Really? So it's a really kind of counter- Sorry, thank you. It's a, it's a quite a counterintuitive finding, which mm. I would imagine would change very strongly. Whereas those over thirty, about the mean, fifty five percent. So we're a little cautious about this first round of data because that it's a pilot mm -hmm. that and it's a little small. But um, as we go ahead, this is definitely something we'll watch. And I like the suggestion about further probing the economic union because the way the list experiment is set up. We can't really say who picks what, mm -hmm. but on that question, we can ask directly. Okay. So that is something to, to, want to yeah. look at. And to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, just on that CSPO, it's not even answer, but my question, not the question, I comment is this is remarkable because gender difference. I've never seen yeah. such difference, 32 to 87. And mm -hmm. I really, would be curious when they uh, aligns with other data, maybe taking before the events, or because this is really uh, curious. Uh, on the couple of questions, so how could U.S. support Central Asia in the second hand situation? And I think uh, U.S. does not have to support Central Asia directly. We know that that's a red line for Russia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's why we suggest that the U.S. and the international community more broadly should support intra-regional Central Asia-based cooperation more, which is one of the ways to diminish Russia's leverage in the region. And second, uh, help Central Asia diversify the transport, energy, and other infrastructure-wise areas, which is different from talking about democracy and liberal, liberalism and so on. We, we are not saying that that is a bad thing, and that should not be perceived in Central Asia. But uh, as in the beginning we mentioned, Central Asia's reluctance to support Russia is not at all about viewing this uh, fight between Russian dictatorship and Ukrainian democracies. Not at all. For well, Central Asia, this is basically a small state whose existence is questioned by people powerful military. So there are inevitable trade-offs here. Uh, if the US comes in and speaks about well, Central Asia is supporting democratic frame that is not going to resonate with uh, none of the countries of Central Asia. So, uh, one question was the, where Central Asia is turning to if it's away from Russia, which uh, I don't, I wouldn't really go to this kind of black and white description. Uh, I think Russia is not going anywhere in Central Asia, so it's kind of it should be really managing our expectations at the beginning. But, uh, however. I don't think that we have a kind of uh, magic answer that this is it China, is it Turkey, is it US. I think for Central Asia, this is a mix of everything. 
a diminishing of the role of Russia is not and should not be coming uh, to be replaced by similar dependence on any particular. And I think Tensorians are very cautious about all sorts of dependence. But uh, illustrative is the fact that during the Samarkand summit in China, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, railway uh, agreement was signed, separate protocol was signed to symbolically move the project forward, which is what Tensorians are very eager to transfer to why they manage the dependence on Russia on the most of them. So, but that doesn't really mean that China is coming to replace a security guarantor, just like Russia or Turkey. But we know that Turkey, China, and the in the broadening CSCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which now includes Iran and India and Pakistan, these are all the baskets where Central Asia is going to count on and not an extreme of that. And finally, on the sovereignty issue, the question was, is it about the state sovereignty or post-colonialism? And I think, uh, and uh, of course, this is just my opinion, we, we can discuss uh, in the context of this paper, and as we discuss Central Asia's response to Ukraine, this is not about post-colonialism. It's not about the appreciating the role of uh, Chinese Russia or the how Russia relates to Central Asia and our course in general. Post colonialism is a nice topic and it's uh, taking traction now, growing in popularity, particularly among Central Asian academics, particularly among Central Asian academics not based in Central Asia, uh, but even in Central Asia as well. Nevertheless, this is more of a kind of academic, uh, in arts, and in anthropology, and so on. But for the political decision makers, this is, I think, very plain and simple that uh, these countries now see that Russia is both willing and capable of questioning what we saw was settled case, settled agreement about what was the post Soviet war boundaries. And that is, I think, the biggest red line for us, for the central positions. Here I stop and uh, okay, I'll, 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 be, I'll be quick. Um, Generational change came up uh, in various parts of the questions. I just want to make one clarification. Uh, I think I speak for both Shire and me. If not, then I just speak for me. Um, <laughs> uh, I, so so, so Shire's point was that, uh, that the, the, the relation, the deep relations that once existed with Russia are no longer. I think one thing that we have to be very careful about is not to fall into the trope that Western academia has fallen many times that generational change is going to be liberalizing. Um, and I just want to, yeah, I have a very good friend in the, in the Central Asian government, I'm not gonna get very I'm not get specific because people are gonna figure out who this friend is, who used to be a very prominent pro-democracy person who is now supporting arguably an autocratic government, um, and, and this friend is my age. Uh, so we, we, we can't fall into that, we can't fall into that trap. So I, we have to be careful when we talk about generational change. And we have a very bounded discussion of it in the paper. Um, but Paul, you're talking about this is is it problematic that that uh, you know Google talked about the masters in DC uh, and how these countries are being, um, you know, maybe published to DC. I don't think anyone in Central Asia is going to question that Central Asia is a puppet to DC anymore. I mean, DC's gone. Uh, I, I don't think, basically, the pushback against Russia is a lot of it's going to be nationalist, Central Asian nationalists, um, rather than pro democracy folks. So I, I don't really see that as a major challenge for Central Asian countries the way but, it is for Ukraine. But what about the challenge for the United States? Is the United States going to be interested in that? Because Putin really thinks that he has the puppet of the United States. And so as the US re-engages in the region, how do we deal with that issue? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. It's more of a, you're right, it's more of a challenge for the United States. I don't, I don't think it's a challenge at all for Central Asian countries mm -hmm. at this point, whereas it had been in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see where you're, where you're going. Um, uh, and then this last issue, is it problematic that Zelensky is phrasing this as a war of democracy uh, against authoritarianism? Um, I'm always struck by how Central Asians, uh, and I think correctly, can simultaneously support elements of democracy um, uh, and also support elements of their current government. Um, so I, I think Central Asians actually like some of this discussion about democracy. And so I don't see that as terribly problematic either. 
Um, the, the view is very, I think the view is nuanced, more nuanced than, than I certainly had given it appreciation for in, in my past work. All right, so I am gonna take full responsibility for uh, running out of time. And because I failed at the chair, I should never, ever, ever be assigned <laughs> to the chair again. Um, so we have 15 minutes break, and I encourage you to approach individual uh, panelists with your questions. Uh, or if you need a break, take this break. But it's uh, just a few minutes past three, and I'm going to apologize. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Give a round of applause.